Coming up on DTNS, Europe cracks down on tech. Walmart pulls the safety drivers, and Patrick Beja gives us the lay of the land in gaming after the release of the new consoles. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, December 15th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the eternally dark forests of Finland, I'm a very tired Patrick Beja. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. Yes, but from those dark forests, Patrick helped us uncover all kinds of mysteries about Sting in our wider conversation on Good Day Internet. I guess Although that might... I believe... I believe, Tom, the word you were looking for is yes and. You don't say yes, but. <laughs> yeah, get that wider conversation to Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Nikai Asia's sources say that Apple plans to produce up to 96 million iPhones in the first half of 2021, which would include the latest iPhone 12 range and older iPhone 11 and iPhone SE phones. That's nearly 30% year-on-year increase, although industry-wide component shortages could still bring that number down. A source also says that Apple is working on a new Apple TV and preparing an aggressive production schedule for new MacBook Pros and the iMac Pro in 2021. Mm, M1 chips for everybody. Delicious. The elect.com sources say that LG Display may convert its Gumi factory from making automobile and wearable displays to making panels for the iPhone with an aim to supply 40 to 50 million OLED panels for iPhones in 2021. Signal has added support for end-to-end -end encrypted video calls. You can have up to five people in your call, and Signal hopes to increase the number of participants it allows over time. Ireland's Data Protection Commission issued a €450,000 fine against Twitter for failing to promptly declare and document a data breach that the GDPR requires breaches of personal data be notified within 72 hours about. Uh, the company apparently was not aware of it, uh, so anyway, Twitter was fined. The bug was in the... A protect your tweets feature that may have exposed some Android users to private tweets to the public internet. Way to go. Twitter said that inadequate staffing over the holiday period in 2018, when the bug was discovered, caused the delay. Twitter also announced it will shut down its Periscope mobile apps by March 2021. We got the official word. Uh, new users will no longer be able to sign up through the app starting now. An archive of all Periscope videos will stay online, and you'll be able to download your Periscope videos by March as a big old archive. You can continue to stream live through the Twitter Live feature on Twitter. Gosh, I wonder if I have any Periscopes I should download. Have not checked in a while. Samsung mm -hmm. president of mobile TM Rowe confirmed that Samsung will hold an event in January and implied that the S Pen support might come to more phones. Rowe also indicated that Samsung will have a portfolio of foldable phones that will be more accessible to everyone, which probably means cheaper. He also said that Samsung wants to do more with UWB for things like opening your car door or finding lost objects. All right, let's talk a little more about these big new proposed bills in the EU. Let's do it. The European Union proposed two bills on Tuesday. So we'll start with the Digital Markets Act that would preempt preemptively block anti-competitive behavior by companies with 6.5 million euros in revenue or a market cap of 65 billion euros or more, which also serve 100,000 active business customers and 45 million active end users. So these are, you know, big companies. So it Google would, and Facebook, got it, all right. Right, right. <laughs> it would create obligations towards smaller firms and end users, such as price pr transparency for online advertisers, better data portability for end users, and the like. So that's the Digital Markets Act. The second bill, called the Digital Services Act, would require large tech companies that reach more than 10% of the EU's population to actively look for and mitigate risks from illegal content and goods that might be available on their services with annual external audits, uh, new transparency rules so users understand what's going on. It allows for the application of local laws as well. The proposal keeps the current liability shield that protects services from content posted by their users as long as a good faith effort is made to correct problems, but it also increases the obligations needed to keep it. Penalties could include periodic penalty payments of up to 5% of daily, average daily income, and continued violations could lead to divesture of business units. Each bill must be approved by the European Council and European Parliament, which is likely to take years, but they're taking some steps. 
it's it it feels like something that uh, the the European Union has been kind of asking for these kind not these specifically but these kinds of uh, laws. Your the EU has been dancing around these things and you know implementing things like GDPR, like essentially trying to take back control over the big companies that make up the internet today, which means they make up a lot of our even physical world. And I, I think there might be good things and bad things in every law, but I think from a European perspective, we don't usually don't think those would be a bad idea. Maybe we would squabble about the details, but I would suspect that most people would think, you know what? Yeah, let's hold them up to a certain standard. Yeah, and it seems like what they're targeting with this is the criticisms that if you overregulate, uh, you'll squash new businesses from entering. So they put these very large revenue and market caps on anti-competitive behavior. Uh, they're really trying to stop tying in services to say, well, if you use Android, you have to also use this and that. Uh, and so so they're, they're really targeting, I mean, I jokingly say Google and Facebook, but they're also targeting Amazon and Apple and, and other big companies. They're trying to make this still be open for smaller companies to grow, uh, which is the big concern. The big concern is that these companies are elbowing out everybody else and there's no there's no more room for any other tech companies. The second bill is, is very interesting because it is trying to address the same thing that Section 230 uh, addresses in the United States, that idea of you're not responsible for what your people say on your platform uh, unless you're aware of it and we've told you you have to take it down. And they're just kind of increasing the penalties for that. I found the, the local law part of this very interesting. So for instance, if there's, let's say Hamburg says, uh, anybody who does an Airbnb has to register with the city, then you could get in trouble under the Digital Services Act if you're not enforcing that. If you're not saying, okay, if you're on Airbnb in Hamburg, you got to register with the city. I mean, I'm not saying Hamburg does that, but I'm just using that as the kind of example where they will allow for local variation and still require these big companies to know what all those local variations are and enforce them. Yeah. I mean, Airbnb, great example, right? Because you've got, <laughs> I mean, I, I have uh, quite a bit of uh, experience with uh, Airbnb and what the company is doing and what it assumes that the hosts, people who you know offer up places for other people to stay in, understand is not always the same thing. Communication could be better and it should be. And this is probably going to force better communication. But yeah, like you said, local laws could make things uh, very convoluted. I want to reemphasize the fact that uh, that second bill specifically only applies to companies that reach more than 10% of EU's population. Um, so maybe reach should be defined a little, should be clearly defined, but it's not the tiny mom and pop shop that, you know, just shows up, right? It's not going to be an imposition on every small company that tries to get its, uh, its services out. Um, and I do want to mention, uh, uh, it seems like these things don't happen unless governments force them. And that is what the EU is trying to do, maybe clumsily sometimes. But I don't think, I mean, it's difficult to judge from here, but it doesn't seem like they're horrible laws uh, on the face of them. Yeah, Facebook even was fairly positive uh, in its reaction to this. Uh, there, there was a little, little more trepidation from, from Google and Amazon uh, about it, but um, there's been a lot of work with these companies too uh, to, to take into uh, account their legitimate concerns. Well, the UK also announced Tuesday its plans to in introduce a bill next year to cover what it calls online harms, requiring social media companies and search engines to help prevent a range of illegal or potentially harmful material from being distributed on their platforms or face fines of up to 10% of annual global revenue. <laughs> Sounds kind of familiar. It would let UK regulator Ofcom demand action against child abuse imagery shared in an encrypted message, for example, even if end-to-end -end encryption was 
as a last resort. It would cover all kinds of user-generated content with exceptions for product reviews and news publishers' comment sections. That bill won't come before Parliament until next year, at the earliest, would go into effect in 2022. All right, that one I'm not too sure about. <laughs> well, and we need more details about it to be yeah. sure about it. It's it's in the earliest stages. Yeah. Uh, more details continue to come out related to the attack on SolarWinds Orion network management platform and its use to intrude on email networks at government and corporate networks. We talked a lot about that yesterday, if you need to catch up. Researchers at Velexity said Monday that they had encountered the same attackers penetrating a think tank organization three times in 2019 and early 2020, and the attackers were able to bypass multi-factor authentication provided by a company called Duo by gaining administrator privileges on a target network and then stealing the secret key, uh, what Duo calls its A key, from a server running the Outlook web app. They could use the A key to generate a valid cookie that would be set when accessing an account that they had already acquired the username and password for that would bypass multi-factor authentication. It just wouldn't happen. So MFA wouldn't fail. MFA would never be called because they could forge the cookie to look like it already had been called, essentially fooling the authentication server into thinking multi-factor authentication was satisfied. Some more details on the malware that was actually implanted into Orion also came out. It identified its network traffic as the Orion Improvement Program when it was passing around. It stored data inside legitimate files to try to keep it from being detected. It would also search for security and antivirus tools in order to avoid them. And the operators never communicated from outside the network with the same computer or network more than once. That, that way there wouldn't be a buildup of suspicious traffic from a particular source. And they would only connect to the malware from outside the minimum amount of time they needed to to gain access to stolen credentials. Then they would just use the stolen credentials and not access the malware. Again, reducing the ability to detect that something wrong was going on. Uh, the malware also didn't use any code from previous malware, which is often uh, something malware makers do, which made it harder to detect. Can't wait for the movie. This is so convoluted and complex. And uh, I mean, there's a movie to be made about a lot of this, I'm pretty sure. Sorry, this is my technical take. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 fascinating stuff, and we're going to keep getting more revelations about this. Obviously, just the number of important organizations is going to keep building up. Uh, we we talked about a few of them yesterday, but but more U.S. government organizations, uh, more corporations, and it is going to be fascinating to find out how this operated. Uh, this is a sophisticated actor. It's obviously nation state backed. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that your average attacker out there can pull off. Uh, it, it may sound easy to be like, oh yeah, you get admin privileges and you steal the secret key, but even admins don't necessarily know how to extract that key and create the forged cookies. Uh, and if you're going to come at Duo and say, well, why didn't you protect your secret key more? Duo's point is, well, if you are an admin, you should be able to access that secret key uh, for creating these cookies because most people wouldn't be able to create a cookie out of it. Uh, and there's certain administrative reasons why you need to be able to access the A key and flush it out. Uh, and all of that. So, so their point is the real, you know, the real problem here was that they got in and were able to get admin privileges. Because once you got admin privileges, you have all kinds of things you can do bad. All of this is really, you know, the the super technical aspect. What impresses me even more is the care, the care, and the carefulness with we with which they access the network, you know, not using the same computer or the same IP more than once and all of that aspect, it it screams like spy thriller to me. Again, yeah. movie stuff, but um, it's very impressive. For 18 months, Walmart has been conducting a pilot of autonomous trucks from Gaddock. The two companies plan to pull the safety driver next year. Oh, no. New drivers 
just doing it on their own. Gaddock added its tech to multi-temperature box trucks to make autonomous trips with a safety driver on a two-mile route between a dark store. Those are, those are the stores that you can't actually go in. They're not like retail stores, but they supply things for people who order them. And a Walmart neighborhood market in Bentonville, Arkansas. The pilot program has covered 70,000 miles in autonomous mode. Next year, the trucks will start operating on that route without safety drivers. The companies also plan to start a pilot with safety drivers on longer routes in Louisiana. Those trucks will take a 20-mile route from a Walmart supercenter in New Orleans to a pickup location in Metairie. Gaddick claims that its approach is different than other autonomous vehicle companies, though. It breaks the deep neural networks into micro-models and then gives them spe specific tasks. Gaddick claims that this allows for optimization with less data and implement gatekeeping mechanisms to ensure more safety. Now, you might recall that Walmart is also working with Waymo, Cruise, Neuro, Udlev, Baidu, Ford, and Postmates on autonomous vehicle delivery. So safe to say they think it's got some legs or you know, some wheels. <laughs> we literally, uh, we've, we've been talking about this for, for years, uh, tech news today and daily tech news show both. And, uh, a lot of people have been saying, uh, it'll be 40 years before you, you, you were able to, to pull the driver. And this is not the first time we've seen someone pull the driver. Uh, and I think it's also notable that Walmart is one of the companies forging ahead, not by trying to create the technology themselves, but by working with almost everyone who's doing it uh, to say like, let's try this, let's try that. I mean, that that's how you figure out what works with new technology like this. Uh, and the fact that they're now going to be doing that on on what what is a real route, a 20 mile route uh, from an actual Walmart super center. I mean, the dark store just feels like they made a, a, a small warehouse just to test this out. Going from an actual Walmart super center in New Orleans to to Metairie, again, probably not terribly practical for a lot of people, but it's a it's a thing that is closer to what you would use this for in practice. Yeah, it's it's becoming serious. I think, you know, you say some people have been saying it's going to be 40 years. I also think some people have been saying, you know, it's going to be five years. And, you know, maybe that was four years ago. So they were a little bit optimistic, a little bit too optimistic. But it, for all of the sort of um, disappointments that some of the big companies trying their hand at this have been uh, uh, showing in the past couple of years, maybe. There's also a lot of companies that are holding steady, and maybe it, it wasn't going to be five years, but, you know, tech people are terrible at estimating the rate of tech advance advancement. When a new technology arrives, people think it's going to be like, oh, in three years, it will be, everyone will use this. It actually takes a little bit longer but it doesn't take 40. It's like you can double it if maybe you're right. And it seems like we're on that track. I don't think everyone's going to be in an autonomous car um, soon, but, you know, these kinds of trucks are could change a lot about the way we, we envision society. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think both are right. It will, it'll be 40 years before everybody can take advantage of this and it's widespread, right? Because it just takes a long time to yeah. work out all the details and be able to work in all the different environments. But the five years for, you know, having actual services out there, it seems like we're on track for that. What do you want to hear us talk about on the show, folks? One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, Patrick, we got all the new hardware out uh, for gaming. What is, how's it doing? What is it doing to us? How's it going in there? <laughs> it is creating stress and anxiety because they're <laughs> selling out all the time. You can't get one. Um, so we have the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X and Series S. Um, these are the latest uh, consoles from those manufacturers. The previous generation was from 2013, so it's been a, a little while. Um, they're a lot more powerful than the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One were at the time they launched. Uh, they're also significantly more expensive. These are, uh, let's round it up to 500 
dollars. Uh, the Xbox is a little bit different, though, if you haven't heard. The X is the really powerful one at 500 bucks, but there's a less powerful one at 300 bucks, the Series S. And um, it's it, so, but all of them are, are sold out. So if you don't have one yet, it's very unlikely you're going to get one. Yeah, I, uh, I keep seeing all these stories come across my feeds of like Best Buy says they'll have a couple more in stock tomorrow. And then, of course, by the time everybody jumps on that, they've sold out of whatever they have. It's a really successful launch. Um, it's kind of, we don't yet know exactly what the reason is, but it is, they produced, they, they manufactured, uh, apparently, as many as they could, which is more than they did in the past. Uh, and even with COVID, they managed. But uh, I think my explanation, which might be wrong, is that uh, gamers grew up and have a little bit more <laughs> av uh, um, uh, available income. And mm. we have new gamers. And so the population of gamers is just growing growing and so more people want consoles um so the on on paper the series x is a little bit more powerful than the playstation 5 uh we haven't seen that pan out uh yet and there are some you know technical reasons why it, why it might not be that important uh but the playstation 5 also has some interesting hardware so if you're um, you know, if you're not sure which one you want to get, then that's probably not going to help you because they both have their advantages. Uh, the PlayStation 5 has a super fast SSD that uh, could lead to actually streaming the assets from the game directly from the SSD into uh, the RAM fast enough that you could actually move your character and it would stream the, the assets as you're moving. So that's like for people who understand this, really exciting technically. And uh, the controller has some interesting, innovative um, features like the adaptive trigger, which is uh, the triggers on the, you know, on the controller can resist your pressure. And uh, it can be set to uh, simulate, for example, a bowstring or a, a, a bowl you're breaking and it, locks it and then when you keep pressing a little bit more you force a bit more it unlocks and so you feel like you've broken it stuff like that um, technically they can do 4k 120 hertz ray tracing they probably can do all at once <laughs> but because that's for some games are very demanding and they both have backwards compatibility although uh, the ps5 has uh, backwards compatibility with the ps4 and the xbox has uh, Xbox One and all of the previous consoles as well. So it, I mean, it sounds on paper like the Xbox is the better console, but that's not what's happening. That that it's it's more neck and neck, or even Sony maybe having a slight lead. I mean, define better. It's kind of difficult to well, you know, it's right. Like well, it got all the specs. So you know, but in practice, not necessarily. So uh, computing power wise, it seems like uh, the, the Xbox does have a slight edge, uh, but things like the SSD on the PlayStation 5, which is a lot faster, twice as fast as the Xbox's one, is also a paradigm change for game development. So it's really, I would say at this point, it's difficult to say which one is the better one, even if you want to, you know, take into account the, mm -hmm. um, the, the, raw, the, raw, uh, the raw power that even that is kind of not certain yet. Although, yes, it, it seems like the Series X might have might take it. Now, uh, um, the, the, the real reason to buy a console, though, is always what games you can play, right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the, that is where the real battle is going to happen. And uh, they, again, it's really difficult this year because, or this generation, because they both have really strong uh, assets. The PlayStation has a lot of exclusive games, which will only appear on that console, on that uh, uh, series. I'm sorry, not series, but on the console, on PlayStation 5, things like uh, God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, and a bunch of others. And uh, Microsoft has Game Pass, which I'm sure most people know, but if you don't, it's essentially a subscription that will give you access to uh, hundreds of games, day one, including the ones from Microsoft that has purchased like 20 studios over the past years. So they're going to have a lot of games, and they're all going to be available day one for that 10 uh, bucks a month subscription of Game Pass. And that's only on, on uh, Series X and to an extent on PC, but for consoles. So it's, diff it's really difficult to make a choice. Um, but if you want to buy a game for this uh, 
holiday season, I would recommend, you know, if your niece likes video games, don't buy Cyberpunk. It's bugged and it's very much a mature game. So not that. Um, but there are a few games that are really fun. Hades uh, is a cool one on PC and Switch. Immortals Ph Phoenix Rising is a, is a kind of a surprise. A little bit more mature with like swordplay and killing. Ghost of Tsushima is a fun open world game set in uh, medieval Japan. And if you want something a little bit more harrowing, The Last of Us Part Two is an absolute masterpiece. Cool. Thank On you so much, Patrick. Good recommendations, man. No problem. Well, dust collected from the Ryugu asteroid 300 million kilometers from Earth was returned by the Hayabusa 2 space probe and opened up this week. The Japan Space Exploration Agency, or JAXA, was hoping for 100 milligrams of material. They got a lot more than that. JAXA's Hirotaka Sawada said that he was speechless when they opened the container and said, I think that next I probably screamed... I really don't remember. <laughs> Next time, the team will remove and weigh the samples to see exactly how much was obtained. Yeah, uh, we got we got asteroid dust uh, for the first time. Like, wrap your head around that. We went to an asteroid. Yeah, Chinese just brought uh, or are on the way to bring back some more moon rocks. We've had those before. It's cool that we're getting some more, but we've never seen asteroids before. And I I love this story about how they're like, okay, we think we got enough to work with, and they open it up and. <laughs> I, I can't wait to find out exactly how much, but it sounds like they got way more than 100 milligrams. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. going to be 120, and it's going to be like, oh, but it's so much more. <laughs> you don't understand. Right. That's 20% ah! more than we expected. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, so much research to be done. No, it's great. This is great. I I, I love when, uh, when people who care about this sort of thing and make the effort to go ahead and collect... Uh, asteroid dust from really far from where we live um, are pleasantly surprised with what they get back. Cool. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We have good news for the Good Day Internet Folding Team, which has broken into the top 200. Yes. Good job donating those cycles, everybody. Keep it up. And if you haven't joined yet and you'd like to, uh, we've got a link in our show notes. Yeah, just go to stats.foldingathome, uh, or, or actually just go into our Discord and go into the folding <laughs> channel. It's probably the best way. Right, I know, it's sort of long string. But if you have feedback on anything that we talk about on the show, you got questions about anything we talk about on the show, anything coming up on the show, all that good stuff, send it to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you in advance. We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels today. They include Tim Ashman, Brandon Brooks, and Tim Deputy. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. Boy, did we miss you. Uh, we hope oh. you've been well. And what have you been up to? Because I know December is a pretty busy month for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing a lot of stuff all the time. But it, you know what? The easiest way, notpatrick.com. You'll find links to everything I do. A lot of stuff in French, some stuff in, in English, including gaming stuff with the uh, podcast Pixels. But everything is at notpatrick.com. So go check that out. Go do it, folks. Uh, and also, if you want to hear me and Patrick together, go check out workinsanity.net. We just finished our, our latest season of uh, tips on how to work from home. Hey, we love patrons that uh, support us so much that we're giving you stuff. Uh, you can get a unique sticker, a mug, a T-shirt, or a hoodie every three months as long as you stay a patron. Uh, each one has a unique piece of art from Len Peralta, starting with one with the DTNS 7-year anniversary logo. Uh, then there's one with that logo plus Roger. Three months after that, you get one with Sarah. Three months after that, one with me. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS. Everybody, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. Put it on your calendar. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it again tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>